In a desperate attempt to catch up with my Q&A questions, which I'm two years behind on, I'm going to answer 10 questions today. So let's get on with it. I'm going to leave the timestamps in the video description so you can skip ahead if you want to see what the questions are or anything like that. So let's get on with the first one. So the first question comes from William Houston. He says, I just want to know why the Germans bombed Stalingrad with the Luftwaffe to the ground. Little did they know they'd have to rebuild it. And just to point out, I've answered the other two questions that he asked in previous videos. So you're assuming here that they actually wanted to rebuild Stalingrad. But is this really the case? Did they actually want to do that? And the answer is no. Why? Well, this goes right back into Hitler's ideology and his goals for the war in general. So I've been over this before in a few videos, including the Hitler socialism video. It doesn't matter whether you agree with that or not. The point is, if you go to that video, you'll see there's a section on this idea of the Lebensraum in the East. And essentially, Hitler believed that Germany should be the industrial heartland for this Greater Reich, and that the East would be the Lebensraum, the living space. This would consist mainly of farmland, for the German uh, farmers, warrior farmers, and these would have Slavs um, as their slaves, basically. And there would be very few cities. There would be the odd German city here or there, but most of it would be rural. And these cities and farms would be connected by autobahns, and all these autobahns would go to the Reich, and that's where the in industry would be, So, and the cities. So essentially, what Hitler wants is the East to have a bunch of resources like food, oil, uh, the mines and stuff like that, have all these resources here, and then they would all send those resources to the heartland of Germany, which would produce the industrial goods, which those industrial goods will then go to the East. So it's farms for industries and industries for farms. And this has to do with the idea of the shrinking markets concept, and also this silly idea that if you've got built-up areas, you cannot produce farms. And if you've got loads of farms, you cannot produce cities and built-up areas. It, it's a silly way of looking at it. But that's what Hitler believed. And so when it comes to the Soviet cities, he, he starts off as he wants to pursue them. He wants to destroy them, bomb them, uh, encircle in Leningrad and starve them out, uh, capture Kharkov and starve that population out. And when it comes to Stalingrad, he says the same thing. On the 2nd of September, he issues an order saying that the civilians are to be evacuated from Stalingrad, uh, the city is to be bombed and not made a, an industrial centre. So he wants to destroy that. That's why the Luftwaffe went in in the first place. And those civilians are to be deprived of food and they are to be shipped to the Reich. It's, it's all in his policies. And this ties into the hunger plan where 30 million Soviets are meant to be killed. And when the commandants uh, of the 6th Army reached Stalingrad, they actually assessed the situation with the civilian population in the same way. And this is an idea of a zero-sum game. So the idea is that if there's two people and this guy has, then this guy must be deprived. And uh, this is fundamental to several ideologies. Let's not go there. But the point is that Hitler believed that if the Russian people had resources, then that would deprive the German people of resources. And so the German people must steal from the the, the Russian peoples. That's how he perceives it. And obviously that's not how it works. You can both produce at the same time and mutually trade and benefit each other. But that's not how certain people see the world. And that's exactly what Hitler saw it as. So to answer your question, why did they bomb it? Well, they bombed it because they didn't want the city to be a city. They wanted to destroy the industrial center of Stalingrad and they wanted to kill as many civilians as possible. And they thought it would demoralize the Soviets and that they would just stream in and take the city anyway. Don't forget how they said we can take it in 10 days, which they obviously didn't. So that's the reason why. And, you know, did they realize that they had to rebuild it? No, they didn't want to rebuild it. That's the whole point. Edward Johnson said, I was listening to Beaver and wanted to know if the Soviets had any chance of victory at Stalingrad if they had not been willing to expend their manpower commitment at Rzhev. Yes or no? So what I think you're trying to get at, or what you're trying to say, is that if the Soviets hadn't attacked at Rzhev, German manpower wouldn't have been drawn to Rzhev and some of it could have gone to Stalingrad. And had that happened, that the German 6th Army or whatever would have been in a better position to 
fight during Operation Uranus time. Or maybe even just win the city outright. If that's what you mean, then no. The German 6th Army, and Army Group B in general, is starved of replacements from July onwards. I've been over this in the previous video of Stalingrad. They are starved in July, August, September, and then they start to get a bit more manpower in uh, October, November time, but it's by then it's too late. Now, there is a battle of Rezhev in late July to early August, and then there's other ones as well, but this doesn't explain why they were the Army Group B was neglected in the July, like the whole of July, and then August, the whole of August, and then so on. Now, there's a few reasons that have been proposed. One is that Halder was an idiot. Uh, the other one is that Halder was secretly on the uh, German resistance side or whatever. Possibly. We don't, we don't know because the archives relating to that topic are still closed. Yay! So I can't really speculate on that one. I just think he's an idiot. Uh, uh, the admin side of the German situation is just ridiculous. So they'd starve Army Group B as, as a whole, and all three of the other Army Groups get priority. Also, there's a problem when it comes to the Third Reich in general. The Third Reich has the manpower, but the Nazi Party, Hitler, there's politics and economics versus Speer, the whole thing going on over there, they're not releasing the manpower to the Eastern Front, which is why in 1941 the German army grows, 1942 it shrinks, and then in 1943 there's more Germans on the Eastern Front than ever before. So what happened in 1942? Why did they neglect that? And that's to do with the whole situation in the Third Reich, in politics and economics, and blah blah blah. But in terms of manpower at Stalingrad, to me it's, it's an admin issue, and it's also a logistical issue. And I don't really want to go too deep in that here, because I want to leave that to the Stalingrad series. But in my opinion, the reason why Army Group B is starved is because the Germans, or the German logistics, was in dire straits, especially by the September of 1942. So this idea that, okay, if the, if the Soviets hadn't attacked to Rezhev, this extra manpower could have gone to Stalingrad, no, because the logistics didn't allow it. Or no, because Halder messed up. <laughs> or Halder's staff messed up. And I know people are going to get annoyed at this because they think the Rezhev did actually starve the Germans at Stalingrad of manpower. I think that's too simple of a explanation. And I think this is a problem when it comes to seeing military history as a chessboard. If you don't... It, there's no logistics in chess. There's, there's practically no logistics when it comes to Hearts of Iron 4. If you're viewing the Eastern Front or World War II or any war without the logistics side of it, then yeah, of course. Why didn't why didn't they send troops to um, to Stalingrad when they could have you know done? Well, the reason why is because of the logistics. Why didn't they send troops to North Africa? Logistics, <laughs> all right. Why didn't they land troops in the North Pole? Logistics, right? The, the, there's the logistics is a major part. You know, the army marches on its stomach. Well, the German army was barely marching because its stomach was in dire straits. And so Anthony Beaver and others are suggesting certain solutions to a problem, which, great, if you take the logistics out of it, that makes perfect sense. But when you put the logistics in, oh no, no, it doesn't make sense because they can't send more troops to Stalingrad. If they did that, they'd be even in worse problems. So, but yeah, I'll, I'll, over, I'll go over this in the Stalingrad series uh, very soon. Scott said, The Stalingrad series has been amazing so far. I was wondering if you could recommend a good book on what was happening south in the Caucasus in the summer fall of 1942. I see Glantz wrote a book about the counterattack out of the Caucasus, but not the stopping of the Axis in 1942. In general histories, it is generally hand-waved over, mumble mumble, logistics didn't reach Grozny or Baku. But after the detail about the battles in the Don Bend and outside Stalingrad, it seems there is likely more to the story, and the Red Army likely stopped von Kleist. It seems they were stopped by early September, and what figures I see, it seems both sides took around 300,000 casualties in 1942, which is not small. And while logistics were likely atrocious for the Germans, looking at the map, they seem like they would be terrible for the Transcaucasus front as well. The rail line comes from Rostov, and Volga shipping was under fire. 
did the Caucasus have sufficient industrial capacity to supply the Red Army in the area, or were they being supplied across the Caspian Sea? On a map, the other side of the Caspian Sea does not look very developed. Yes, and I'm going to recommend a few different books depending on your circumstances. So if you've got a ton of money and you really want to dive super deep into this, like the more detail than you probably imagine, then I'm going to recommend Glance. Which am I going to recommend? I'm going to recommend the first two books out of uh, the, the trilogy, which is actually four books and got an appendix. So it's a five book, four part trilogy on the Battle of Stalingrad. I'm going to recommend the first two books, which go into super amount of detail on the Battle of the Caucasus as a sort of side note <laughs> to the main battle of Stalingrad and the Fablar campaign. That will give you the most detail you'll ever probably need. If you don't want to get the five book, four part trilogy, uh, what you could get is the standalone version, uh, which has more recently come out. Alternatively, and this might be the easier option. Uh, Death of the Wehrmacht by uh, Robert Satino, The German Campaigns of 1942. The good thing about Robert Satino is that he he has a really, he's kind of like a narrative history. A bit like Beaver in a sense. Like, you know, it's very easy to, to read and pick up. Glance is very much like, this regiment did this. And this, and, then, and it's it can be kind of overwhelming. Satino's got that more narrative flow. Uh, Satino doesn't go into super amounts of detail, but he, he gives it a good chapter, I believe. Yeah, he's got a whole chapter coming to a halt, the Caucasus and Stalingrad. And he does a good job of explaining the general situation. So he's definitely not skipped over it. He's not mumble mumble skipped over it. He's actually done a pretty decent job. And that's a great book in general. Probably his best, actually. So this or them. <laughs> you make the decision there. As far as the logistics is concerned, yes, the German logistics was terrible in the Caucasus, let's put it that way. However, the Soviet logistics were not as bad as you would imagine, and there's a couple of reasons why. The British and the Soviets had actually conquered Iran. So you're mentioning the, the Caspian Sea. Oh, you know, how can the Soviets get ships across the Caspian Sea? Well, A, they were doing that anyway, but also they could actually go underneath the Caspian Sea. lend supplies were also coming up through there, into the Caucasus. So it isn't quite as bad as you would actually imagine at first glance. There were several factors as to why they didn't reach Baku. One, it wasn't actually necessary. They actually just needed Mayakop and Grozny. And they took Mayakop and they bombed Grozny, but they didn't take Grozny. And there's a couple of reasons why. One, uh, the logistics. Now, I know some people want to downplay it, no, the logistics was a major factor. They were struggling. And List is saying, hey, you know, he's stretched so thin over a massive area and uh, he needs more supplies, he needs more manpower, and it's a whole thing. And Hitler's not happy with him and he gets rid of List, takes over the army. So, so Hitler's commanding an army which is miles away from where he actually is, right? There's a disaster. So there's leadership issues, there's logistics issues, also terrain issues, so they get to the Caucasus, as in the hills, the mountains, and then they get bogged down in that. Obviously, panzers aren't going to do so well in the mountains. Um, they also shift forces away from Army Group A to Army Group uh, B in on the Don. So they at first they take away 4th Panzer Army, and they do that quite early, I think in the August time, or late July, August. They take away 4th Panzer Army to send it towards Stalingrad. And then later they take away the Romanians. They took one Romanian army out of the Caucasus and put it on the Don front because they needed to. And also the Soviet resistance as well. Um, it will be incorrect to not mention that. So there are several factors here. Also the weather as well. So there are several factors here. So it's not just a case of, oh, it's just logistics. And and I don't want to downplay any one of those points. Which one was the major one? You can We can debate that all day. But there were several factors as to why... The Germans didn't take Baku. And Satino, going back to Satino again, Satino actually says the Germans actually came really close to achieving their objectives, even though they really shouldn't have come that close to achieving their objectives. And, uh, you know, I'll let, let you guys read that when, you know, but uh, I, I tend to agree, like, considering 
how far they had to go, considering their opposition, and uh, so on and so forth, it's, it's surprising how far they actually got. So this isn't actually a question, but I wanted to point it out because uh, I messed up. So I want to apologize to Armin here. Armin asked, why did Nazi Germany declare war on the USA in 1941? I've already done a video on this, and what happened was Armin asked the question, and somebody else asked the question, and I just missed Armin's uh, question out and didn't put him in the video. So I just want to apologize to Armin uh, today to say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I missed you out, that was my mistake. But as part of Armin's question, he starts talking about American isolationist politics and the intervention. So I'll just read this part. Everybody knows about American isolationist politics. Yes, they helped with Lend-Lease, they imposed sanctions on Japan, they started to patrol Atlantic Ocean, etc. But it's not to start war or invade as Nazis and Japan did. It was unrealistic for Roosevelt declaring war on Nazi Germany only because one day he alone wanted it. He needed a big reason to declare war. But before December 1941, Hitler did not give him a reason. Hitler ordered not to sink American ships and many other orders to, as to not provoke the USA. Well, Kevin Mack has also asked a very similar question. Now, I don't fully understand his first part here, but I'll read it anyway. Hi, Tick. I'm new to the channel, but my question is, what was the relationship between the North African campaign with possible emphasis on how US involvement with the British Army? I don't know what that actually means, uh, but he goes on, he says, also, what would happen if Rommel and the German divisions in Africa were all sent to fight the Soviet Union? Not sure if this is covered in another video. I'm trying to figure out how US involvement assisted the Soviet Union and the British during the Lend-Lease era of the war before Pearl Harbor. Going off his last part here, I'm assuming then that the first question he asks here is, you know, what was the relationship between the North African campaign with possible emphasis on how US involvement with the British? I don't know what that means, but I'm assuming it, what he is meant to say was, what was the relationship between the British and the United States and how much did the United States help the British in the North African campaign. If that is the question, then that's all related to Lend-Lease. And this ties into Armin's question because, you know, how much is the USA involved in the war without actually declaring war? Because if they're sending Lend-Lease to the British, and they're sending Lend-Lease to the Soviet Union, and they're doing all this other stuff, are they already in war, just not officially? In terms of the British in North Africa, the first Lend-Lease to arrive was, as far as I'm aware, the M3 light tanks, the Stuarts, that arrived just before Operation Crusader. So I've already done Operation Crusader video, you wanna go and check that out, that's fine. That was November time, you know, this is late 1941, this is just before uh, Pearl Harbor. So the first Lend-Lease was arriving at this point. The Americans seemed to be pushing for a war or moving America towards a war. They've got Lend-Lease being signed, so they're directly involved in that sense. I need to do a video on the British economy, but I would say that Lend-Lease kind of keeps Britain in the war. Uh, Britain basically was bankrupt in 1941, so the United States basically keeps them propped up. So there's that. Obviously, they're sending support to the Soviet Union. There's lots of trucks, minerals, you name it. Uh, they've also got the Atlantic convoys. Uh, the USA is becoming not antagonistic, but it, it's keeping Germany in an ever smaller bottle. Again, this goes back to the idea I brought up in the previous video on, you know, why did Germany declare war on the United States or why did Hitler do it? This is where Hitler's like, hey, we're already at war. You know, America just, we just haven't signed the dotted line in terms of fighting it. We're already fighting it. And I, to some extent, that that I think is, is correct. The United States was certainly on the side of the British by late 1941 and uh, was being antagonistic towards Germany. Would it, would it, a uh, war have been declared had Pearl Harbor not happened? Probably not. I think Hitler probably would have waited until something had happened, but the point is, you know, to say that America was neutral in 1941 prior to Pearl Harbor, I would say no, because Lend-Lease is proof of that. Lend-Lease is proof that America was not neutral. And then Kevin said about, well, what would happen if Rommel and the German divisions in Africa were all sent to fight in the Soviet Union? 
not a lot. Uh, even assuming that they could have supplied them, not a lot. Three divisions, it's neither here nor there when it comes to the Eastern Front, let's be honest. Would it have impacted the North African campaign? Yes, the Italians would have been thrown out of Libya very quickly. <laughs> It would also have strengthened the British position, which may have influenced Roosevelt to come closer to the British, because in the early part of the war, Churchill was trying to get Roosevelt on his side. This kind of undermines the argument that they were in it together. It was a grand conspiracy. Churchill was having to show Roosevelt, no, 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 no we'll fight for France. OK, we're the only ones here now. We'll fight in North Africa. Look at us doing really well during Operation Compass. Uh, Oh, yeah, we'll send troops into Greece. Oh, we'll send, because we failed there, we'll send troops to uh, Crete. And then when we fail there, we'll, we'll, we'll hold on to Tobruk because we can't do much else. He's trying to persuade the Americans that the British are standing firm and not just trying to peace out, which they kind of were trying to do, but then they, they didn't. But that's another story. So if the British had knocked out Libya early on, and proven to the the Americans, hey, you know, Britain can win a campaign uh, in North Africa because Rommel had gone to the Soviet Union, let's say. Well, that would have been a, a quite a significant victory. And uh, it would have been interesting to see what would have happened with Operation Torch. But as far as I'm concerned, Rommel, three divisions in or more in the Soviet Union wouldn't have really done much. We've now got three oil-related questions, starting with John Weatherby. I have been a little curious about the idea as to if Germany might have had a chance if they captured more oil in 1942. Did Germany have the refining capacity to use the oil? Did the fields also have refining capacity? While I've agreed on the concept, I have also asked myself if Germany had the capacity to refine the crude if they had captured it. While I can find some sources on oil, I haven't found much on the actual refining capacity. So Germany itself did have enough refining capacity, but that's Germany itself. So they would have had to ship the oil from the Caucasus to Germany, which was a nightmare in itself. Now, there were some refineries in the Soviet Union. The North Caucasian refineries had an annual throughput of 19 million tonnes and were easier to destroy and harder to rebuild than the oil fields. So yes, both Mayakop and Grozny had oil refineries, as did Baku, so capturing them intact would have been the best option for the Germans. But they would have still had to ship a lot of the oil back to Germany to use it. And Toprani talks about this. I'm gonna guys, I'm gonna I keep saying this, you guys need to read Toprani. I wish he'd write a book um so that I could just recommend that, but he hasn't done as far as I'm aware. So just read the PDFs that you can find online of Toprani's works uh, they will set you straight when it comes to the oil situation mr kim has said hello tick enjoying your videos as usual i know you discuss this a bit in your video the main reason why germany lost world war ii oil but can you go into more detail on the possibility of a german campaign into the middle east Military historian Bevan Alexander seems to think that the Germans could have gotten Middle Eastern oil, and you mentioned the difficulties of getting the oil back to Germany. But what would the Axis have had to do if they had planned this from the beginning? For example, could the Italian Navy defeat the Royal Navy in the Mediterranean after France fell? Of course, this would be a very different war from the actual World War II, but I was curious if this was even a possibility. Okay, so let's just assume... Uh, that they somehow conquer the Middle East via North Africa. Let's just go with that. Yes, they would have had major difficulties getting that oil from the Middle East to Germany to refine it. There were some refineries in the Middle East, and I believe there was one in Egypt and a couple in Palestine area, I think. So that, yeah, they, in theory, they could have taken the Middle East and had a little bit of oil, but they would have had to ship it back to Germany. And this then goes, well, in order to do that, you need the Mediterranean. And then you need a fleet in the Mediterranean. And you need ships in the Mediterranean that could run this. And that's where you get to the Italian Navy and also the merchant fleet. So here's the problem with the Italian Navy. For most of the war, they were sat in their docks. And the reason why is because there wasn't enough oil. And the reason there wasn't enough oil was because Germany didn't have enough oil and Italy didn't have enough oil. 
And so what ended up happening in the Italian fleet sat in dock and got blown up by the British. <laughs> and so they they weren't able to... Now imagine, okay, instead of the Germans going east, which was the ultimate goal anyway, let's imagine they said, okay, we're not going to go east. We're going to send what oil we've got to the Italian Navy, who are going to help us and the merchant fleet and help us in North Africa. Well, it would have certainly helped... Would it have been enough for the for Rommel to get to Egypt and then to the Middle East? The problem with the idea of sending more supplies or divisions to North Africa is that the capacity of the ports on the North African coast do not allow this. So even if they had a fleet that had enough oil to actually operate, which they didn't, they wouldn't be able to offload the supplies onto the coast. The capacity of the Libyan ports to unload cargo and to refuel ships was limited. Tripoli, the largest port and often the only one open to the Axis, could handle only 45,000 tons a month and was far from the front. Benghazi, maximum capacity 2,700 tons a month, and Tobruk, 2,000 tons a month, often were unavailable or their capacity was reduced by Allied attacks. Getting material overland to the front burned up much fuel. The small capacity of the African ports limited the size of the convoys. Instead of running a relatively few large convoys, the most efficient method in terms of convoy defence, the Italians had to send many small ones, which was wasteful of escorts and fuel. The Italians initially used truly massive escort forces, including cruisers, but a looming fuel shortage forced them to drop this. And then also, would there have been enough oil for the ships to then allow the oil, to collect the oil from the Middle East, to then ship it to Germany, to then refine it? Capturing and exploiting the oil fields of the Middle East was not a simple matter. The logistical obstacles for German military forces were immense, possibly insurmountable, without concurrent attacks from Egypt, Turkey and the Caucasus. Capturing the oil fields would only lead to new problems. Extracting, transporting and refining Middle Eastern oil would require massive expenditures of capital and resources, not to mention long-term peace and security, during which the local oil infrastructure could be built, or as the case may be, rebuilt. Germany's resources would be stretched to the limit simply trying to restore production in the Caucasus, and it made no sense to fritter away resources in Iraq or Iran, especially since doing so would not decisively alter the strategic calculus in Germany's favour by knocking Britain out of the war. Besides the difficulty in bringing the oil to consumers in Europe via pipelines and tankers, Middle Eastern crude oil was sour, high in sulphur, and processing it would require special measures during refining. Again, this is way too much. What would have been more ideal would have been taking the Caucasus. The Germans had enough problems logistically through the railroads between Germany and Italy that there were shortages of coal for the Italians. So you can imagine how bad the situation would have been if they had to add more uh, trains to the lines in order to get the oil that Italy has shipped to itself up to Germany to be refined and then sent back to Italy and then also the rest of it. It's a nightmare. And also this would have broadcasted to the world, oh, by the way, we're in the Middle East now. We definitely don't want the Caucasus oil or anything, right? Stalin's obviously going to react to that. I think what would have been an easier option would have been going through Turkey. That would have been an easier option. However, we ruled that out before. <laughs> so to be honest, I don't think this was even an option Mario says, I read a book by Andrew Roberts called Storm of War, where he basically says that Germany could have won the war by taking three basic measures. One, instead of attacking Russia frontally, finish the British in North Africa and the Middle East, securing Middle Eastern oil and attacking the Caucasus from the south, thus going straight for the kill as far as the Russian campaign is concerned. Two, coordinating their actions with the Japanese, offering them the whole of the USSR east of the Urals. Three, concealing his intentions regarding the Jews until total victory, so Germany would keep the lead in science and technology by avoiding the exodus of his best minds to the USA. Incidentally, this is the same basic premise pursued by Stephen Fry to write his novel Making History. I can spot a few of the mistakes in that logic, especially regarding tiny Japan taking over gigantic landmass of Asian USSR. 
but I also find the other two points rather intriguing. Would you like to look into that? I mean, they were struggling to keep Rommel supplied as it was. That's why when they failed to take Tobruk, Rommel couldn't go anywhere. And that's why he had to take the, the uh, port of Tobruk in 1942. It's also why his second offensive broke down. I need to do this. This is why I need to do more videos on the North African campaign. Maybe I need to take a break from Stalingrad to do that. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, and, you know, I just don't think it's realistic. I think what happened in reality is more realistic. That going towards the Caucasus makes more sense to me than going to the Middle East. And then also it misses out on the food situation. There's a food crisis in the Reich in 1940, 41 and 42. And the Germans need to conquer the Ukraine to get that food to the Reich. So if they'd have gone through the Middle East, there's not a lot of food in the Middle East. And so that would have been a major issue for the Germans in 1941-42. So again, this is, you know, focusing on one thing, you're missing out on other things. And I think going east would have made more sense. You're right, cooperating with the Japanese to take... Imagine the Japanese taking the whole of Siberia. It's just, it's just not going to happen. And then concealing his intentions regarding the Jews until total victory. And I also am going to add on to here as well, let's say the Ukrainians and the other Slavic peoples. Let's just imagine, you know, because this is what people do. They imagine, oh yeah, if if Germany hadn't had this annihilation policy and had walked into the East and had said, hey, we're going to, you know, liberate the peoples of the East from the Soviet terror. Yeah, in theory, these uh, let's say Jews and, and Ukrainians would have been happy with the Germans and it would have been they would have helped the Germans and there wouldn't have been a, as much of a reason for the Soviet Union to keep fighting so on and so forth. Great in theory but it has massive, massive problems first, would Hitler have got elected but let's not go there. Secondly Hitler, what Hitler has done essentially is, is created a ideology at the very least what it does is unifies the German people, gives them a common en enemy, and then justifies that war, at least for them, okay? So the way that Hitler paints the war is that it's a war of Weltanschauungs, which is war of... Uh, Weltanschauung means worldview. So it's a war between two worldviews. So the, the idea is that Hitler's got his worldview, which is the Aryan or the Nordic worldview, and he's going to fight and strike and take out the Jewish worldview. And so he's fighting this ideological war to against this entire ideology and worldview, and so that's what he's doing. And as part of this, he needs, or he thinks he needs, to wipe out the Jews, enslave the Slavs, and, you know, destroy the cities. And so the last thing he wants to do is you know, go in pretending to like them all because the whole point of the war is to strike and destroy those people and that that civilization built on that uh, Weltanschauung, supposedly. I'm not saying the common soldier necessarily gets all of this or understands all of this, but what I'm saying is that the German generals, the high command, so on and so forth, they understand this. Keitel says this, you know, this is a war of ideology, this is a war of Weltanschauung, we're going east. The doubts expressed correspond to the soldierly conception of chivalrous warfare. We are dealing here with the destruction of a world view. Therefore, I approve the measures and support them. So if you take that away, what are you left with? No war, right? He has no reason to unite the German people and go east. That was his whole point of his ideology. This is where I think historians are going wrong. They're, again, the focus so much on the military stuff, the sticking to tanks, and they're not looking at the ideology, the politics, the economics, the sociology, the blah, 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 blah. They're not doing that. And this is where I'm trying to say, no, 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 I'm not going to just stick to tanks. We're going to look at all this other stuff too. War Eagle said, hey, Tick, I hope you're well. I just want to get your take on the classic docuseries, The World at War, narrated by Lawrence Olivia. It obviously doesn't go super deep into any specific battles or statistical data, but I'm curious to hear what you think about it. I find it very entertaining, and have watched the series at least three or four times. Assuming you've watched it, do you find it to be accurate? Sensationalist, your general opinion. Anyway, thanks for the awesome videos. War Eagle out. As an old classic documentary, for its time, it was brilliant. 
And there's several reasons why we'll get into that in a second. But what I really like about it is the intro, um, where the it has a picture of somebody and then it burns it away and there's another one behind it. And it like goes through that and has the music playing. I really like that. I like the general concept. It gives a nice little overview. As far as I'm concerned, it's a if you've no idea about World War II and you're living in the past, <laughs> like 1990s or something, it's it's great. It's a good introduction to World War II, but, you know, as you pointed out, okay, it doesn't go into any depth at all. It doesn't talk about specific battles too much. It doesn't talk about statistical data. It's out of date. And so, yeah, it's got great narration. Yeah, it's got good, you know, visuals in the sense of it's showing you all the old footage. It's a good introduction. That's about it. Beyond that, it's kind of poor. <laughs> And to be honest, it's not just this, it's it's all the TV documentaries. The issue with TV documentaries, or anything on TV, the main problem is that they have to play it super safe. And that's the way that YouTube's going as well, unfortunately. You have to play things super safe. You cannot say something that, you know, annoys people. If I came out and said, I don't know, something ridiculous like Gavin or the 82nd Airborne, was the reason why Operation Market Garden failed, on TV, you would get thousands of people in the comments telling me I'm wrong. Oh wait, that happened anyway, right? But the problem, the difference is, is that I've got a backbone. Unlike these TV corporations, uh, they don't have this backbone, and so they can't just go, well, you know, argue back, tell us where we're wrong. Uh, no, they, that's not ever going to happen. The good thing with YouTube, or at least the good thing... With the conception of YouTube, YouTube itself, the corporation, are ruining this, uh, is the idea that we can have this debate and we can say something uh, that maybe at first glance might sound uh, insane, but then we can have that debate and go, oh yeah, actually there's some truth to this, or oh no, no, this is completely insane. So, Gamma 8 Second Airborne uh, was the reason why Operation Marketing Garden failed. Oh, that's ridiculous. Every documentary and book I've ever read says the otherwise. And like, well, here's all a bunch of sources, and here's what actually happened, and here, let's lay it all out and do the timing. Oh, yeah, wait, there's something to this. You can't do that on TV. Uh, the D TV executives want to play it super safe, not rock the boat. And so what you get is this watered down... You know, it, I can remember back to the old documentaries where it's talking about uh, Operation Mark Garden. And all it is is the British land at Arnhem. The British reach Arnhem Bridge. The British are at Arnhem Bridge. The British lose Arnhem Bridge. The British fault is Arnhem Bridge, right? And it's like, that. what is that? That's not, a, that's no information. You watch an entire hour and you're like, oh, wow, I learned like three things. History lies in the heart of the debate. You need that debate in order to bring out not only the interest in it, but also all the details, because that's where the devil's in the details, right? That's where it all comes alive. People are complaining right now, oh, Stalingrad's way too long. You you need to speed up. <laughs> or, well, just skip the bit, get to Operation Uranus. No, right? No, because if you want, if you want cat videos, if you want five minute history videos, there's plenty of channels doing that. This channel, the idea of this channel predominantly is to give you in-depth history and then discuss it. That's the whole point. It is, in a sense, to be triggering and to be controversial because that will bring out the debate and get people interested and get you guys buying the books. I guarantee I have made people buy books. I've probably made people buy books in this video, right? They're probably this one. People are like, oh, I should go to the bookstore and get this, right? They have done that because they want to get involved in that debate. So as far as I'm concerned, if you've never seen anything relating to World War II before, yeah, World at War. Why not? As long as you go more in depth. That's that's the key. If we get that interest first, then go more in depth. And we've got a couple of questions on the Italians. Guy Andrew says, Hi Tick, what do you think of the Italian performance in the Second World War? Would you rate them as poorly as often perceived? I have read some work by James J. Sadkovic uh, on his topic, and he seems to be revising this topic quite well. He is not without critique, however. What do you think? So I've sort of covered this in two previous videos. Uh, Operation Compass and Operation Crusader. And this is why I need to go more in depth on the, uh, the North African campaign, because the Italians play a major role in that. And as I've shown in those videos, they can be good. 
they can also be really bad. <laughs> so let me um, let me just explain this. So in Operation Compass, which is probably the best British victory of the war, the British absolutely annihilate the Italian army in North Africa. And you might say, well, that just proves how poor the Italians were. No, even the British praised the Italian artillery. The Italian artillery stood there, ground, and fired away right to the last second as we were getting destroyed against the British tanks. Problem is, the Italian artillery had no guns at all, not one gun, not a single one, that could take out the British Matilda tank. So the Italians had, their weaponry was so poor, they couldn't take out the British tank. And they were stood their ground and fired, even though it was a completely futile operation, they had no chance at all, and yet they stood their ground and died or became prisoners or whatever, or fled the battlefield. <laughs> Like even the British said they would, you know, the Italian artillery were decent. Rommel says that the Italian infantry, uh, the actual soldier, were decent troops. The issue wasn't the Italian soldiers, it was their officers and their generals. We'll come back to that. So we have decent infantry, we have decent artillery. During Operation Crusader, the Italian's uh, Areti division holds the south. So the British come through, they have a battle with the Italians, or a few battles with the Italians in the south. The Italians actually do really well. And even one of their black shirt battalions actually does well in that scenario. They're guarding one of the hills, and they actually do pretty well in that scenario. The, their tanks, which weren't great, let's be honest, however, for their time, they're okay. Not amazing, but they're okay. They actually do pretty well. The Italian Areti division was the armoured division. So... We have good, it's good soldiers, we have good artillery, even decent artillery, we have decent um, armoured division, at least early war, and in some cases, even the Black Shirt Battalions can do pretty well. Okay, so what's the problem? Well, as Rommel says, it's the officers, right? Oh, well, it must be because, and I've seen this in some of the books where they say, well, the Italian officers and the Italian soldiers and the Italian mentality, they just make poor soldiers, right? This is where the, I'm not going to say racism because it's not its not really racism, it's just national nationalism comes into it. It's not to do with the Italian mentality necessarily. And I've been over this before as well. So Mussolini enters World War II on a, bit of, on a bit of a whim. And he basically declares war thinking, I'll declare war, we'll be at war for a couple of months, and then we'll, you know, the Germans will win it, and we'll just get some benefits from the peace negotiations. That's literally how he decides to enter World War II. He is totally unprepared. So what Mussolini does is he expands the army without actually expanding it. <laughs> Well, this is a really bad policy. So I've been over this before, but just briefly. So in a typical infantry division at the beginning of the war, you would have three infantry regiments, each with three battalions. What Mussolini does is he gets two of these divisions with three infantry regiments. He takes one regiment from each of these, right? And he takes them and he forms a third division. So... Let me see if I can do this with my fingers. Probably not. So he's now got three divisions. <laughs> right? Well, he hasn't. All he's done is just split these divisions up and, you know, move them around. Now, he does add extra artillery and guns and whatever else. So, you know, he does expand the army slightly. But the point is that these three regiment divisions now become two regiment divisions. And this has a major impact on the officers and the generals. Why? When you've got three, let's say you've got one general in charge of three regiments. There's more manpower, because there's, there's an extra third man, more manpower. You then also have fewer officers, right? There's one general put for that division. So what? Ha so let's say there's two d divisions, right? And you've got a general in each. That's two generals for two divisions. What happens when you create this third division? division right you got now you got three divisions rather than two you need an extra general where's that general come from the lower ranks so officers who are not capable of leading divisions are being pushed up the ranks quicker because they don't have 
enough officers. There's a shortage of officers. Now, in World War II, this happens to the Germans as well. The difference is, is that the German, and it happens to other armies, but the Germans, for example, their officers are really experienced. They get their experience when they're in the three regiment divisions. And by the time they go down to two regiment divisions, they've got a lot of experience. So those officers can move up the ranks quicker. The Italians don't do this. The Italians start the war by having two regiment divisions and having their officers go through to the higher ranks earlier. And this is why they've, they're have led by, is you know, lions led by donkeys in a sense. They are led poorly as a result of that. So it's not because of the Italian national spirit or the Italian mentality or whatever, as the other authors might claim, it is in fact Mussolini messing up <laughs> uh, and also just military policy. They, they messed up massively at the beginning of the war. Their logistics were awful uh, because of the oil situation. They also had their tanks were poor overall. And again, this goes back to Mussolini not being prepared for war, uh, their air force is a bit dodgy. Uh, and so, you know, the Italians have got good soldiers, but they're giving bad tools and they're led by donkeys because of the policy that Mussolini and his generals implemented at the beginning of the war. Are the Italians bad? Not necessarily. In the right circumstances, with the right experience, with the right equipment, etc., they can do pretty well like the Eretic Division during Operation Crusader. But, for the most part, no. Zalman has also said, I have just watched your episode on fascism and Mussolini, fascism defined. It leaves me wondering why Mussolini wanted to be allied with Hitler. He must have known about the Nazi leadership's contempt for his ideology and that they wouldn't treat Italy as their equal. Yet, he seems desperate enough to pass laws he didn't believe in and bring a village idiot, Evola, to prominence. Why was this alliance so valuable to Mussolini? So I kind of went over some of this in a previous video, so I'll get you to watch that after this. But essentially, Mussolini is isolated after the Ethiopian crisis, so he's no longer in with the West. He therefore decides to align himself more with Hitler. Hitler then does really well in France, and as the French are capitulating, or as they're getting beaten up, uh, Mussolini declares war and takes a little bit of territory in France. He wasn't prepared for war. He joined the war thinking that he'll piggyback off the Germans, and when the Germans, uh, when the Western Allies peace out, he'll get a bit of territory as a result of that. So it was just piggybacking off the top of it. So he wasn't prepared at all. The Italians rely on the Germans for coal, oil, everything. <laughs> they need Rommel. Mussolini has to kind of get in favour of Hitler to get those resources and equipment and Rommel and whatever else he needs in order to do what he wants to do in the war, to have a hope or a chance of actually attaining victory. And this is why he's then moving his ideology towards the Germans. Essentially, Mussolini messed up. And had he stayed out of the war, had he been another Franco figure and not got embroiled in this larger conflict that he wasn't prepared for, there's a good chance he probably would have not only survived the war, but gone on to you know die of old age in you know in the 1970s or something. And maybe there would have been a chance of the ideologies of National Socialism and Fascism not being sort of morphed into one thing, which they're not. Right, there would have been a distinction, and maybe today, instead of, you know, seeing the Nazis and fascists as the same thing, more people would have been aware. Oh no, there is a difference between the two ideologies. Maybe, I, you know, I, no idea what would have happened. But Mussolini's biggest downfall was his declaration of war in 1940. There's no doubt about that. And uh, yeah, so anyway, that's ten questions answered, which I'm glad because I'm. <laughs> I will catch up at some point. I will catch up to these Q and As. But next week is Stalingrad. Fingers crossed I can get it done in time. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye for now.